Hello and welcome to Illini Drive here on 1071 WPGU. Man, today is a day. We got NBA trade deadline. We have assistant coaching for Illinois to talk about for Illinois football. We have a, a game on Tuesday night that we haven't had a shot to talk about yet. I'm sure the show yesterday got into that, but man, it's going to be a good show. I don't know how we could do more than an hour. We always say we could do more than an hour. Today we could probably do like four hours, but I'm, I'm excited. I'm Eli Schuster. I'm joined alongside Isaac Trotter, Producey Tati Perry, Tati. <laughs> Producey. Producey Tati. <laughs> I'm going to call you Producey Tati and uh, Potty because Potty's um, also your I nickname on the show. I prefer Producey Tati over anything, so right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and stick with that one. But I'm right. good. Good, good. And then uh, today filling in, we, we've had a rotating role on this show the past couple of weeks, and it's been nice. Uh, Alec Bussey. Alec, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm a little nervous to make my radio debut. It's nothing to be nervous about. The show is, as you can tell already, <laughs> the show, there's <laughs> nothing to be nervous about. Um, we're happy to have you here. There's there's plenty to get into. Uh, and I think the first place, the most fitting place to start is to be talking about Tuesday night. It's something that, you know, most times you don't want to talk about a game a couple days afterwards. You're going to look ahead to the next one. Uh, and, and, you know, there is a game this weekend uh, against Rutgers that, that we can get into a little bit. But this win was so big, was was really so monumental for what this program is trying to build to that we have to touch on it more and and uh and Isaac I guess the thing that we should start with here is looking at Io DeSumo's performance I think that's the area that I want to start uh he keeps putting up these numbers keeps putting up these stats against some of the best competition in the Big Ten and you know the conversation we've had time and time again is this is this guy is you know an NBA draft is something that we have to think about and you know, if he continues, again, not a lot of high major competition left in the season, but the fact that he's been able to do this against some of the top competition in the Big Ten and now against the number nine uh, in the country, which is now falling, that won't be the same anymore. They'll be out of the <laughs> top ten. But Michigan State team, uh, what's that say to you? You know, when I look at Io DeSumo and I came in, I, I thought this kid could score ten points a game, get you four rebounds a game and three assists. And I thought that'd be a great freshman year, right? I didn't want to have too high expectations for a freshman year because what Mark Smith did last year, and I had these expectations, and then he goes <laughs> oh, out I and remember. does four points, right? Right. I was anointing him as the next chosen son of Illinois yes. basketball. <laughs> Adesumu has exceeded every single expectation that we had set. He has done it on the biggest of stages, and on Tuesday night, he was absolutely spectacular. 24 points, three steals, two rebounds. Was terrific against Michigan State. They, they, he, they had it going from the very beginning. He's being guarded by one of the best defenders in the country in Matt McQuaid and scored 14 points and missed two shots in the first half. And then he gets to the second half, kind of cooled off a little bit. And then when the time gets tough and when Illinois is going through that eight-minute scoring drought, he demands the basketball, knocks down back-to-back -back huge threes. The State Farm Center explodes, and it's just one of those things that you go, that kid's legit. And it wasn't just that performance. He, he did it against Maryland earlier this year where he dropped 20 against them. Number two, Michigan earlier in the year, dropped 23 on them this year. He just does it on a big stage over and over and again. And you just can't be I, – I don't think there's anything else he could do to impress me this year. He has been marvelous. Anything that I had exceeded or any expectation I had for him, he's taken that bar to a whole nother level, and he is so exciting to watch. And you kind of look at it on, on, on paper on, Monday, or on Tuesday, and you think, okay, Cassius Winston's going to be the best player on the floor. No. I would assume he was the best player on the floor. Well, we talked about on this show before the season even started about kind of what you said. Our expectation and my expectation as well was I, I'd be very happy if he could be a double-digit score, averaging double digits, and by that I meant 10, 11 points a game. You know, we'd, we'd be it, super enthusiastic with that. Um, and then, you know, we saw early in the early parts of the season, okay, it might be a little bit more than that. Then we also saw that he was he had a better three-point shot than what was advertised, and we said, okay, that's, that's pretty good. And that was on full display uh, in this last game, obviously, with those two clutch threes. And then I think what I've been most impressed about with him, and this is something that he always had uh, high expectations of, of bringing to the collegiate level, was his court vision. I mean, I think the biggest play in that game was not even his threes, and, and Brad Underwood touched on it. It's the fact that Andres Feliz got the and one, but it was dumped off to him by Ayo Desumu after he drove in, gave a great pass underneath to, to Andres Feliz, who could put it up easily and get the and one. With one and second on the shot clock. Exactly. And so the awareness and the court vision that I've seen from him uh, for me, has probably been the aspect of his game that I go, okay, yeah, this guy is is NBA ready. He was made for the big time, right? And, and you just kind of see how when the, you know, everyone gets tense and, and the State Farm Center is filled with people and everyone gets really tight and you can feel the anxiety, I'd assume he wants the basketball. 
Ayo Desumo goes and takes it from Aaron Jordan and says, give me the ball. And that's a true freshman. He's 18 years old, right? He, he was born in 2000. We kind of talk about, oh, you're a 2000 kid. Like, he was born in 2000. Yeah, I'm a good chunk older than him. It's right. weird, it's and weird to watch him play. And he has no fear <laughs> at all. No fear. And that's the, that is so exciting to watch. He gives you an identity. He gives you toughness. He brings leadership. And he wants to win. And that's, that's everything you want in a point guard. Yeah, and, I agree with that completely. I mean, he, to me, he just screams a Brad Underwood guy with his toughness and his guts as a true freshman to hit those huge threes in the last two minutes of the game. I mean, that's just straight Brad Underwood to me, and he's just really impressive. I think that from him, it's it's nice to see him, you know, bring this, I think, mantra and sell this mantra that Brad Underwood sells, which is these everyday guys, because I think he is the epitome of that in the sense that they have a bad game. You know, he comes right into the to the press conference. He gives you quotes like he's already, you know, already in the NBA, a guy that's already a pro. Uh, he's been doing this forever, so he knows how to work the media, how to tell tell you honestly and tell fans what you want to hear, which is, you know, things about improvement and things about how, yeah, we won this game, but it's time to move on. But when you get a big win, it was nice to see him in the postgame presser sitting there and saying, yeah, this is huge. This feels great. This is a one, he said, one in a lifetime. I'll take that back, one in a long time opportunity. And, you know, the way I read that quote from him is, this is a one in a long time opportunity because Illinois is no longer going to be in this position in this record. Instead, they're going to be one of those teams if he's on it, one of those ranked teams, one of those top of the Big Ten teams that's battling in each game. It feels like this game was a turning point for Illinois basketball, and you kind of go into this one at seven fifteen, and and you you're like, okay, this game means nothing. You have no expectations, right? You don't have any expectations, but for Illinois to go out and jump out to a nine point lead at halftime to withstand the haymaker that Michigan State did and come back with the winning punch right at the end to knock them out and get that win. It felt so big. And, you know, you Brad Underwood was asked, is this a turning point for you? Do you think this could be? And he goes, eh, maybe we'll see at the end of the year, maybe in three years, maybe five years, and say, okay, that was the turning point. For me, that's the turning point. That was it, right? The, you kind of see the, the strides of improvement that Illinois made in just five weeks ago from losing to Florida Atlantic. They're winning. What are they, what are they won now? Four Big Ten games? Yep. They have a chance now with four home games left on their schedule to double that. They go on the road to play Penn State, who's not a great team. You look at the rest of their schedule, you go, yeah, there's a good chance for Illinois to win every single one on this. Will they? No. But there's a really good chance. You could talk about one of the worst teams statistically in Illinois basketball history, win-loss record with like a 13-19, and 12-20 and 20 record, having nine Big Ten wins. Nine. That's unbelievable. And, and that, felt, that game on Tuesday felt bigger than what it really was. Well, I just feel like there's a bigger optimism around the team now, especially, I mean, five weeks ago and they dropped those two eggs to Mizzou and then Florida Atlantic. I think some people are starting to jump off the bad or You're right. right under a bandwagon. We're like, this isn't going to work. His system doesn't work. And now it's totally different after you beat Maryland out in Madison Square Garden. And I don't think that should be forgotten. I think that maybe that's a bigger turning point because it gave him confidence going forward against these other Big Ten teams like Michigan State to be able to beat Michigan State at home. So I think the Maryland game is just as big of a turning point and going forward, and I think that should be one that circles just circle just as much as this one. The, the reason I, I, and I think that's a great point, it's not a game that should be forgotten by any means, but the fact that you now did that, did this on your home court is really what's important. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. And, and the reason that I see, I think all of us, you know, do see this as a turning point for the program, do see this as a relatively immediate turning point for this program instead of seeing it three de- years uh, down the road. For me, though, and I wrote a column about this uh, that was out on the Daily Line today, is the fact that it's the emotions after the game for me that I see this as a turning point. Yeah, it's a big win, sure. Every team, though, every program, you know, a lot of programs around the country get big wins. You know, they get upsets. That's what happens. But for me... Being on the court afterwards, seeing the players' emotions, seeing the fans' emotions, an experience they haven't had since 2013, it, that's why this is a turning point. Because when I see you know, Brad Underwood hug it out with Josh Whitman, more than just the average, oh, you got to win, I'm going to hug it out here. The one, my arms are wrapped around you until we get into the locker room because I'm so happy with what just happened. And seeing you know, even Georgie. Io and Georgie jumping yeah. up and down. Because ESPN's there filming you. And yeah. also Georgie Bashan is really sharing a moment with his brother. All of this brought together, right? All of this happening at once shows that the emotions about this game, shows that the team, the, the teammates on this uh, on this team and currently with the program, shows that this is really a turning point. Uh, they're buying it. They're buying into what this program's selling. And guess who also is buying into it? Everyone that was there and everyone was that's watching on TV and the nation that got to see it. And no one's going anywhere. And I think that's the biggest thing. You saw that game against Michigan State, and 
we can all talk about Ayad Sumu. He was fantastic. But don't forget, Georgie Bishanishvili outplayed Nick Ward, the second best center in the Big Ten. 16 points, five rebounds, knocked down some big clutch free throws late down the stretch. Oh, and Trent Frazier, the guy who's been having the sophomore slump that we've been kind of talked about ad nauseum on this show, he knocked down three humongous threes and had 15 points, played outstanding defense on Cassius Winston. Your core is here. Georgie's here. Io ha- is going to have some NBA looks. He's probably going to be back be next here. year for his sophomore year. Trent will be back. Tevian Jones has continued to improve. Alan Griffin has continued to improve. And then you add a Kofi Coburn. You add an Antoine January, two top 100 bigs to this mix. You can see the vision. And you can sell vision so long. We've seen it in football. Sell the vision, sell the vision, sell the vision. That works, but only for so long. At some point, you have to win. Illinois did that on Tuesday, and that's why you have momentum right now. Because you won, and you can sell the vision. Both of those together. We, we could talk about the guys that uh, that will be here, that that are young, that are going to be here. But one thing that's worth pointing out in that game uh, that that is overlooked is is Aaron Jordan's block was at huge. the end this is an giant. incredible is an incredible moment for him. One of the best moments I think he's had really in his career here because of the fact that that closeout that never works. Okay, anytime that someone that you're off the guy who's about to shoot a three, and then you reach out to try to block it, it's more to get the hand in his face to let you know not to actually. You're never get the supposed block to go the for the ball, the, right? The ball never gets hit. It's just to try to throw the guy off of his rhythm, and he actually tipped the ball. And I give a lot of uh, a credit. You know, I know a lot of people kind of give Aaron Jordan a little bit of a slack sometimes, saying you know he shouldn't be getting all these minutes. I've said that before, and I still agree with it. I think you know you need to split up those minutes sometimes, but you got to admire the guy for continuing to have this edge about him. And he's also, if we talk about people that are a definition of a Brad Underwood player, he really is. Because yeah, he, he he grabs rebounds sometimes like you've never seen. He had a couple great rebounds in the game. And he plays with this energy that while, you know, he may not be knocking down every three that you want him to hit, he plays a little level of energy that is pretty remarkable. And he deserved that moment. 100%. If you think of the four years that he's been here, you could argue that these four years are the worst four-year stretch of Illinois basketball ever. Can you argue that? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious it is. Yeah, Aaron Jordan had to deal with all that in the first two years barely playing. And yeah. then last year, having to do, deal with all of the drama that happened last year, to get that moment this year, to get that block, to get that, to feel like he made a play in that. And don't forget, he scored five early points, which helped Illinois get out to a good Everybody start, Everybody made a play in that game, too. Everybody, Everybody did. A, he was awesome. Another guy that we should definitely hit on, Andres Feliz was terrific against Michigan State. Just He's starting terrific. to come into his own, too. Oh, From yeah. where he was earlier in the season. I, well, he like, was in his own and got out of it, and now he's got he's getting yeah, the past couple point, games. Yeah. He's been back to where he was. we thought he would be and hoping he would be against Big Ten competition because he was doing it against non-conference. Now he's doing it against Big Ten competition. His ability to adjust to the length of the Big Ten and the speed of the Big Ten mm-hmm. so quickly has been really impressive. Instead of trying to get to the rim every single time, he settled for the eight-foot floater, the Joe Bertrand floater that kind of mastered. That's what happens. That He gets really good at that. Now he's knocking down a three, so people have to take a little bit. They have to you know, keep him honest, right? He keeps the defense honest with the three, and then he is just a bulldog defensively. That, that effort defensively, forcing Michigan State into 24 turnovers, forcing Cassius Winston, who might be the Big Ten Player of the Year, into a career-high nine turnovers was like probably the best effort I've defensively I've seen in a really long time. And Brad Underwood said it was the best defensive performance his he's ever coached of any team he's ever coached. That's pretty remarkable. I also think that the three guards, Io, Trent, and Andres together defensively are near the top of the Big Ten defensively as a trio, being able to match up against all three of the guards. And I think that's a credit to Brad Underwood's recruiting. Obviously, Trent doesn't belong to Brad in terms of his recruiting, but Io does and so does Andres. And they went out and found Andres, and he's able to match up really well with against anyone. Um, he's been a great get for them. Yeah, I would say. I mean, yeah, even though he's not that great of a three-point threat, but his ability, he's a number one guy on Illinois right now that gets to the basket when they're not in transition. I right. can get to the basket in transition. Andres is significantly better than that when they're running a half court. He does a really good job of getting his body to the rim, shielding the bigger defenders, yeah. and is able to score. And if I assume he decides to make the dumb choice and leave for the NBA after this year, Andres Feliz will be able to step right into that role and kind of makes that transition a whole lot easier. He is a very underrated piece down the stretch. Well, and Feliz's uh, his ability to finish around the rim is is much one, better than what for, it used to be. <laughs> well, it's much better than it used to be, but also it was it, it looks better than Io's during that stretch. You know, at, at times when Feliz is driving in, the the touch that he has on the ball and the ability to like we said, the size of the Big Ten, he takes you know he takes. Nothing for granted when he's playing out there, and he's able to bulk up right against them. And he's a small guy, 
And so it's really impressive to see him drive in. I'm always impressed to see him throw off a guy when he drives in because the amount of power he gets behind him. And he's a small guy. You see him out there. All these, I mean, they list him at 6'2. He ain't 6'2. No, Maybe six with two. the poofy hair he is. Yeah, but. he's not 6'2. So the fact that he's able to throw off some of these guys is always great. And also, he, we talk about Io's court vision. I, I think he also is another one of these players, maybe second best on the team in terms of how he's able to see the game because the way that he is able to drive in at times and the way he's able to just turn on the speed, that's something he does really well. It's just all of a sudden throwing the speed and then all of a sudden he's inside. So I really like what he has to offer. I think that, you know there's a reason that Underwood called this the three-headed monster going into the year. And one thing I think we should touch on too is this performance against Michigan State wasn't a fluke, right? No. This wasn't a... Illinois hits 19 threes. Michigan State can't buy a bucket and you lose. Michigan State shot 51% from the field. Illinois had shot, you know, 44%, right? They forced a, a lot of turnovers. That's awesome. But what you saw over the last month is so much improvement. From the beginning of the Big Ten, you saw the defensive effort against Indiana and Northwestern and Michigan State, or Michigan. Those were the defenses starting to get there. You saw the offense explode against Minnesota. You kind of saw it all come together a little bit against Maryland. And then against Michigan State, it's also come together too. Like, this team isn't fluky. They're good. These are really, really good. They are long. Defensively, they're really long. Io's arms are really long. And I know Tev didn't get too many minutes against Michigan State, especially in the second half. He's really long, and he he deflects a lot of balls, and Andres gets his hands in the passing lanes as well as Trenton. Georgie surprises me more than anyone defensively, even though he's so under His ball average, screen coverage is awesome. He was the reason they were able to keep Michigan State from scoring on that last possession. His ball screen against Winston defensively was beautiful. It, it, it was textbook, right? Yeah. And, and I look at the rest of this Big Ten schedule, and yeah, Illinois is going to have a chance to pile up some wins, and I think that they will take care of business at home because they're obviously a much better team at home. And you look at this Big Ten tournament, and if Illinois is that 10 seed, I would not want to play them at all. No. There is no way that I would want to play them because their defensive style, and even Izzo talked about it afterward, I don't want to play them. Cassius Winston said this, I don't want. I have nothing to do with them. I want nothing to do with them because what Illinois does to them. I would hate to be that 7 seed or that 2 seed in the Big Ten quarterfinals that has to play a team like Illinois because Illinois is playing at a really high level right now and let's see if they can sustain it down the stretch. We will continue talking about Illinois basketball. We'll look a little bit ahead to this weekend against Rutgers and, and you know, look at that matchup a little bit and also see going towards the, the end of the season now, the end of the Big Ten season, uh, you know, how many wins can they pick up? So we'll talk about that. And then afterwards, uh, we're going to get into some Illinois football. So make sure you stick with us. You're listening to Align I Drive here on 107.1 WPGU. Welcome back to Illini Drive here on 1071 WPGU. Before the break, we were discussing Illinois basketball. We were talking about the Michigan State victory, uh, what it means for the program, looking at a, some of the players, talking about Iowa's performance, and, and a lot of positive remarks in this room, which isn't typical when we talk about <laughs> any Illinois revenue sport. So pretty positive stuff, which is good to hear. Um, let's kind of leave the, the Michigan State game in the dust, though, for now, because just like the players will say, it's on to the next game, and you got to look towards Rutgers. So this weekend on Saturday, I think it's, what, 3 p.m. game? 3 o'clock State Farm Center. on Big Ten Network. Uh, 3 p.m. State Farm Center. Illinois is going to be playing Rutgers. Now, interesting about this game, I, <laughs> one thing that's funny to say, I, I, I guess, is the past couple of years, Rutgers has kind of been a trick <laughs> for, uh, for Illinois each year. It's been a situation where they go there, and you think, okay, it's Rutgers. It doesn't matter if it's football or basketball. It's been, oh, it's Rutgers. And then it's a way closer game. Rutgers-Illinois games have been awesome the last couple of years. I wouldn't say they've been awesome. but I The triple say overtime been, game two years sure, ago was really I mean, good. They're good sure, games, but, but they're not they're quality games. Exactly. They're not, right. That's yeah, exactly right. Say they're good great. Game score, but they're not, they're very not close. great basketball. So <laughs> Illinois has got these four uh, Big Ten wins. Rutgers has four Big Ten wins. Uh, this is going to be a, a pretty good game, all things considered. If you think that Rutgers is going to come in here and Illinois is going to pound on them by 20 points, then you're out of your mind. Well, you're not Rutgers, watching college basketball if you don't if you Rutgers don't know that Rutgers right now is a decent Big Ten team, better than they've been for the past four years. Rutgers is hands down better than what they have. They're athletic inside. They do some things on the perimeter that should give Illinois a little bit of trouble. Geo Baker's a bucket. He's a walking bucket. He's really, really, really good. I do think that Illinois should win this game. I do think that Illinois has the pieces to win this game if their pressure defense can come to play. A, th a little bit the thing that I'm worried about is the 
hangover after Michigan State because yeah, that's a, that's a legitimate thing. You saw what Illinois did against Minnesota, and you're like, okay, they're going to build off it at Iowa, and then Iowa comes out and gets 25 threes, and they were all wide open, and they beat you by 24. You know, so like I do think that Brad Underwood's going to have this team ready to play. I do think that this team, Illinois, is not going to overlook Rutgers by any means. So this is going to be a really good game, and I think that Illinois should win, but it's it's going to be tight down the stretch. I think it's going to be. I think it could be a close game, yes, but here's the thing about both teams. Both teams play very well at home. Yes. Rutgers has been playing very with anybody beat at Indiana home Beat Indiana and yeah. beat Ohio State at the rack. And so this is a situation where both teams play really great at home. Because Illinois gets the advantage here and they'll be playing at State Farm Center, I see this going in Illinois' way. I see this going a game where they can win by 10. But I do think that this is a situation where, you know, heading into maybe 10 minutes into the, you know, 10, 5 to 10 minutes left in the game, it could be a close one. It could be a differential of three points or so. I think that uh, Geo Baker is a great player. I think that they've done a really good job at shutting down guards. So I do think that when you look at some of the guards they've shut down and just see them against Michigan State being able to shut down Cassius Winston, the idea that they can shut down Geo Baker isn't a concern for me. I think they're going to be able to do that. But there's other things that Rutgers does really well that I think can get to this Illinois team. And I do think hangover goes into it a lot. I like matchup wise. You guys keep mentioning Geo Baker for obvious reasons. Him coming in at six four with one eighty, he's basically the same size as Io. I would love to see Io match up against him defensively for a whole game when he's in there, just because I think Io is great defensively. I mean, he had three steals against Winston against Michigan State, but I'm really looking forward to see what he can do against Baker in back to back really big games defensively. I think the beautiful thing about Brad Underwood's defense right now is that he's having Andres, Trent, and Io switch and rotate onto these. You know, lead guards onto yeah, the Cassius Winston's onto the Xavier Simpson because they can really wear them down. And I had a really good quote in the post game saying, No guard in the Big Ten wants to play us because that's what they're going to do and they're going to get all over them. And I expect Geo Baker to really struggle because this Rutgers team does turn the basketball over. They're not the greatest shooting team, but they hit the offensive glass well too. So those are kind of the things to watch out for if you're Illinois on Saturday. But again, this is a game you're supposed to win, and Illinois hasn't been in many of these this year. And now you have to learn how to play like that and learn how to play in a game you're supposed to win and do that because these freshmen haven't really done that more often than some of the you know the cupcakes in non-conference play. Illinois has the most favorable stretch of their schedule coming up, and, and especially towards the end of this year. But when you look at it, this is a team that now plays Rutgers, and then they play Ohio State, who's been on their own downswing. Uh, and they can't they, score. No, but Ohio State looked like they were going to be one of the top teams in the country. Right. A, a lot of people picked them. Yeah, a lot of people picked Ohio State to honestly be a sleeper tournament team. and turn, Not sleeper getting into the tournament, but making a run in the tournament. Uh, that doesn't look like that'll be happening at all. And, you know, your hardest game that you have left of the schedule is probably Purdue. And then you also have uh, Wisconsin. And I would so say going out to Wisconsin, Wisconsin is going to be tough. I think going out to Wisconsin is tough, too. But I, I think that playing Purdue with Carson Edwards, uh, you know, Matt Harms, this Noja team, Eastern. Yeah, this this team does a lot of things that is going to be tough for you. And the athleticism of Carson Edwards, I think, could beat anybody. Plus, you've never league. won at Mac. But, no. But in the Wisconsin, you can potentially steal that game. When was the last game. time we won in the Kohl Center? Um, 2005, maybe? Yeah. yeah. And and winning, so, and 2005, are, Jack Ingram hits, win there. Jack Ingram hits two massive <laughs> yeah, threes to give win. Illinois a win. Both, both destinations, not great to, to play uh, away in. However, you have a better shot against Wisconsin than you do against Purdue, I think, at this point. But, however... Rutgers, Ohio State, Wisconsin, you play Penn State twice, then you have Purdue, Northwestern, Indiana, and then that second Penn State game you ended with. The best stretch is Northwestern, Indiana, Penn State. This is a situation where at the end of this year you could finish on three straight wins. This is a situation where Illinois could finish with 10 Big Ten wins. That's I, unreal. I, if you would have told me that going into the Big Ten, like the second part of the Big Ten play, I would have been like, you're lying. You were 5-12 and 12 and 0-5 and in Big Ten play, and you could finish 10-10. and 10. That's finishing your conference play at 10-5. and 5. Think about the momentum heading into the offseason like if that. they would have played a regular non-conference schedule and finished 10-10 and 10 in this Big Ten, they would be getting into the NCAA Absolutely tournament. agreed. <laughs> Absolutely agreed. And you kind of look at this, and you can kind of, after you beat the number two, the nine team in the country, we can have these hypotheticals like, well, what if Illinois wins the rest of the games? Or what if they go 10-10? They and Right. <laughs> But if they and they're not winning the Big Ten tournament either, <laughs> right? If they finish ten and ten in, in Big Ten play, you're talking about a team that is twelve and seventeen overall heading into the Big Ten tournament. They could win a couple games in the Big Ten tournament Great before NIT they leave, vid right? You could be one of the. You, you could get into the NIT. Like there's a chance oh, sure, for Illinois sure. too, and that was a really long shot when you were five and twelve, when you're zero and five after losing to F, you know Florida Atlantic and then getting crushed by you know Minnesota Michigan State. The NIT is is I mean it's just basically about you convincing. Hey, look, we have enough 
good wins on our schedule. They would. Do this. And, and they honestly look like they're going to have that. Maryland's a great win. Sure. Michigan State's an awesome win. Minnesota's Nebra- also a good Nebraska's win. a solid win. Minnesota's a tournament team. Yeah. You kind of look at this upcoming schedule and think Indiana would still be considered a decent win. Then I you don't took, know. They're bad, man. They're not <laughs> going to win. Langford, but they just, bad, they just beat Michigan too. State, too. So no, they I could understand, say, but that, that they're a bad team. But either way, I, I mean, I agree. Indiana's a quality win. Um, you know, you should get, I think, four more Big Ten wins. I think so, that's, too. That's what I think. I think you could beat Penn State twice. I think you can beat Northwestern. And I think you should be able to, you know, take this Rutgers game. Well, they should have gone up to Northwestern and won, too. They should they, have. How, they There's lost a lot of games that we can last... talk about how they should yeah, have Notre won Dame, Gonzaga. Right? Exactly. Yeah, there's a list of games that we can talk about how they should have won. And... Uh, and now the, the question is, how many do they win? And so I think, you know, you can pick up another four at least. And I wouldn't have said that even two weeks ago. After the Minnesota game, I wouldn't have even said that. If, and we came in here at that game to me. Right. We talk about fluke games. That game to me, and I think all of us that were on the show uh, talking about that game afterwards, was, yeah, this is that, that's a, probably a fluke game. Great game. Good, good to see. Good to see what they could potentially have, but that's a fluke. They shot like 67% yeah. from the field. You're like, I, yeah, I don't correct. think that's yeah. going to happen again. So... I, I really think that the and one thing I will say about Brad Underwood too, he's kind of got a a trend going for him where he goes yeah, on he streaks. Does. He goes yes, on he streaks. Does. Last year, huge streak he made with Oklahoma State, and in, in in their conference play, and then he's done the same thing when he was at Stephen F. Austin. He has a he can go on streaks. I'm not saying that this is a situation where of course this year they're going to win out or any of that stuff, but I'm saying that what we're seeing from this team where they can build late in the season, where they can really build off momentum. We've seen him do that before. And we've seen players develop over the over the year. Georgie Bashan is really so much better than he was week one. I would assume he was even better than what he is. You're kind of seeing Tevian Jones take that stride forward. I think Alan Griffin has been a lot better than what he was earlier in the, in the season. So you feel really good about these youngsters. Again, if you win four Big Ten games, or for, finish 8-12 and 12 in conference play, that's an awesome, awesome finish to this thing. You talk about even finishing... 9 and 11, 10 and 10, those are just cherry on, that's the cherry on top. So overall, for the rest of the schedule, I don't see Illinois going on the road and beating Purdue, Ohio State, Wisconsin. I just don't see it happening. But you take care of business at home, you beat a Penn State team twice that has one Big Ten win, that's a really fit good record. You're not, you're 9 and 11 in conference play, that's a heck of a, that's a heck of a boost for this team. And, and kind of where you were to see what you are now, that just gives you so, so much hope. For the future. Well, and I think it's also really important for them going into next season, just be able to say, hey, we won games at the end of the year last year that we were supposed to win. And then you can carry that over next year and win those games that you're supposed to win. And when you win those games, it makes it so much easier to beat the teams that you're not supposed to. It just gives you that much more confidence. I think you're right, too, because like if you think about it, Illinois would have doubled their win total in Big Ten play. Right from year one to year two, you doubled your win total. So now you have your recruits coming in. Now you have the core that you feel good about. You've coming off an eight and twelve, nine and eleven Big Ten slate. Next year's schedule is nowhere close to what this one was. There's there's an opportunity here, and, and you, I'm not saying that Illinois is going to go to the Sweet Sixteen next year, but you have the nucleus with Io and Trent and Andres and Tevian Jones taking a step forward, and Kofi and Georgie. That's a team that can make the second weekend of the big t- uh, uh, of the NCAA tournament. Sure, no doubt. That's an insane amount of depth because they're going to bring in another guard too. I mean, let's just say it's Christian Brown. They're going to bring. They have a lot of depth next year coming back. Devontae Williams is your eleventh best player. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good sign. I think one thing about this whole uh, whole idea of where this team's heading, where they're going, and and you know the trust they have right now in themselves and in Brad Underwood was really represented. Uh, during an interview that Trent Frazier did after the game. You know, he, he went and did, it was with Andy Katz. You know, they did it on, for March Madness, it was just a Twitter interview that they posted up. And he said something really valuable in that, which is, we're starting to realize what Coach Underwood wants to do works. We're starting to realize what our coach wants to do works. And so while that might go show you, okay, there was questioning at the time or people didn't know what was going on, he says the reason that this is happening right now is because they, they're really starting to trust this system. And that's key to be able to hear it from him, who one was a leader last year and now is a leader right now, still currently on this team, even the situation he's in. To be able to say that uh, when the biggest question has been about Underwood, will his system work in the Big Ten? To be able to now see it in wins and then hear the players say, yeah, we're, we're buying the system. They are buying it. And I wrote this afterward. When you look at what Trent Frazier did with another lead guard coming in in Iowa, and he defers, right? And he gives... Io the chance to knock down those two threes last night, and he gives Io the chance to score 14 points in the first half against Michigan State. Trent deferred. We saw last year Mark Smith and Trent Frazier couldn't play together. 
Why? Because both of them are ball-dominant point guards, and one of them didn't want to defer. And when you see a buy-in of this roster, and when you see Trent go, you know, I'm okay not scoring 30 because it helps the team more when I get Georgie post-touches and he scores 15, and I get Io touches and he scores 18, and I can knock down three threes, get to the free throw line eight times, knock down six of those, and finish with 15. When you see that, that's buy-in. That's culture. That's winning they basketball. They like to win. That's winning basketball. It's about basketball. winning. It's not about I'm here to pad my stats. I'm here to think about how soon I can get up a level. It's about I like winning games. And this whole team from Tuesday night, you can see it more than any other time this year. They like winning. And they love winning. And also they said after the game, we wanted to feel that feeling that we had against Maryland again. And it was great for the Orange Crush to get to rush the court because they deserved a moment like that after the last couple years that they've been through of Illinois basketball There's being a reason every putrid, coach brings them up in the postgame about how hard it is to play the They much. deserve that. And that that was fun. That was good to see. It was fun to see some ha- you know some joy in the State Farm I haven't Center. seen it in four years. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Since I, I've been covering this team, I haven't seen a moment like that. And, and the best – this is now single-handedly the best win that I've covered – uh, during my four years here, the second best is also against Michigan State when it was Malcolm Hill's last game and he was able to kiss the court after and, and he was weeping uh, <laughs> during his postgame interview. Both of the, the best games that you know I, I, Illinois has had in the past four years have been against a Michigan State team and, and it's exciting to see that. But uh, this team is really growing and, and that's the difference between the time they got it against uh, you know them back two years ago when Malcolm Hill had his last game. Uh, they weren't really going anywhere. He didn't know where they were going. This time they get this win, and, and it's really special because you see a, a future developing, which you haven't seen in, in, in quite some time. So I, th- I think we're going to sum that up. I think we're going to be done talking about Illinois basketball. I think that's a good ending place. It's a positive note. Like I've said, we don't get to be very positive on the show. So it's nice to have that have that moment. Right, Tati? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I heard I heard her laugh. Like, oh, well, we're never positive on this show. We, yeah. Speaking we of not talking, being positive, yeah. guess what we get to get well, into? Well, that's, that's exactly the right. The lovely Illini football coach. That's my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> we're going to go to the other uh, Illinois revenue spectrum. sport. Yeah, the other <laughs> Illinois revenue sport. You know, there were positives. Hey, they beat Minnesota, too. That was, <laughs> that was something. Um, no, but uh, Illinois football, they're, they're dealing with uh, their offseason, their own, working out their own kinks, I guess. And... Uh, just just yesterday, there was a press conference where Lovey Smith was able to announce his new assistants and talk about who was going to be defensive coordinator. It's himself. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen that yet. Uh, but the biggest talking point here is the fact that uh, he hired his son, Miles Smith, to take over the reins at the, line, at the linebacker coach position. And I know that for weeks now, this has been rumored. This has been something that, that people were talking about, uh, something that Twitter was very much against if you're on social media. And uh, and they continue to kind of be that way afterwards. And some of those true Illinois fans come out of their shell after it happens, and they say, no, we're going to support them, all this stuff. But for the most part, not super well received. Uh, we, had, we had a Twitter poll at the Jeremy Warner show, the other radio show that I did. We had 1,200 people vote on it. 87% of Illinois fans who voted on that are not happy with this one. Yeah. So. But that's they kind did of say we'll see where it goes. Right, right. that's they a did say, I did say they, it was more. It, there was a very unhappy option, and then there was we'll see where it goes. Right, and so the we'll see where it goes was the was the more <laughs> favorable one. Um, but let's talk about this. I have hot takes. I texted Isaac earlier today. I said I have an opinion that's probably not as strong as everybody else's. Eli's first, part of the three percent that says see, this is fine. I, it's not necessarily that I say this is fine, but I think that people are overreacting, and, and I'll explain that a little further later. But but Isaac, start with your point. You know, I think you have more of a, and Alec, you might feel the same way. You guys might have a more uh, favorable opinion on this in the sense with the rest of the community and the rest of online uh, agreeing with them. So what do you make of this uh, this decision? Wait, wait, wait. Before we go in, what are his qualifications for? Like, what has oh, he done? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> what, what, why does he It depends on position? how you look at it. Here's the thing. Here's what Miles Smith has on his resume. He graduated from Lake Forest College in 2013. He worked as with his dad as basically a defensive quality control coach for the Tampa Bay Bucks for two years. He was the interim coach last year for the corner for the cornerbacks and nickelbacks a little bit after Donnie Abraham left. That's it. So absolutely nothing. Okay. So well, nothing. can we Great. say? Can we so say? Nothing. So I just on. if you're working like look if I'm working with my dad. Um, that doesn't mean I deserve a high paying position and an important position just because I've worked with my dad, which means I'm agreeable to my father. That's not, that's not a good. And Tati has (laughs) stolen everything that I wouldn't wanted to say. No, here's the thing. Here's the thing with this situation. Illinois goes out and gets Miles Smith. 
because after Illinois has one of the worst defensive you know, you know, scenarios defensively, one of the worst seasons ever in Illinois history defensively, this was the hire that they wanted. Why did Lovey Smith do that? Well, he's putting the onus on himself. He's taking the onus as the defensive coordinator. He wants to call the plays. He wants to run the defense because he felt that he did it best. Awesome. That's great. You add Miles Smith to the mix to keep things similar. The problem is, is that Miles Smith would not be a coach at any other program in the country other than Illinois. Miles Smith has one reference, Lovey Smith. Miles Smith has never recruited in his life till this week when he recruited Tariq Barnes for the first time. I wonder if he's driving home right now listening to this bash fest. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a ba- it's not a bash fest. Uh, this, is like all, yeah, this, is all, this is all facts. <laughs> these, these are all facts. They're facts these, that are, these are, are, all are red facts. with a little bit of a hint of... No, he said he stays till the, he says he, he said he stays till the office till 1030 every night. So great. He's listening in his office. Great. Awesome. Great. So here's the thing. When you <laughs> have a situation like this, there is a good reason why Illinois fans are angry. This is a $200,000 job. These assistant coaches' jobs are not very – there's very few of them. Lovey Smith took six months. He said he did a ton of interviews for this, and he decided that Miles Smith was the most qualified for this job, right? <laughs> That's why people are angry. I get it. I get why people are angry. What my perspective is, I'm going into the skeptical. I don't think this was the greatest hire. I think that Illinois is very much able to go out and get somebody who already had locked-in recruiting ties where he is going to be able to go and already have recruits similar to what Rod Smith did when he got here and he said, okay, I'm going to go get Matt Robinson and Kenyon Sims because I know them already. I already have ties to them. I was recruiting them from Arizona. I'm going to bring them right in. Miles Smith doesn't have that. And when they talked to him yesterday and he's going to be in – in Houston, he's never been in Houston before. He's never recruited in there before. It's going to take him a little while to get in there. Illinois doesn't have a little while. This is a make-or-break season for Illinois football, and it's a big-time opportunity right now for Illinois to kind of get back on the map or they're going to have to start over and Lovey Smith is going to get fired. And if he wants to keep it in-house, that's on him. And let's be honest here, Lovey Smith might have – might have made a mistake by hiring Miles Smith. He might have, but he also it, this also could go well. That, there's also a thing like that, and, and if it does go well, I'll be the first one to praise him, but the optics aren't great, and the people inside the coaching staff know that and have told us that. The people outside the coaching staff have known that and say that, and Illinois fans have known that too, and, and that, that's just kind of where it is right now. I just wonder if um, his lack of recruiting makes him more genuine, and maybe that is more helpful because he doesn't know what he's doing, so he is like selling legitimately what is to be sold. And I, I, I wonder if that might be a good point to him and a positive point. But I do think that since he has only ever trained under his father, he has one opinion and it's his father's and that's poor. Like you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to see things from different perspectives if your only experience is the same perspective as the one that is possibly failing already. And that's not you that's could not make good. a strong case that Lovey is surrounding himself with yes men. Yeah, then that's terrible. And that that's not a good look for a defense that is statistically one of the three worst in all of college football last year. I look at it from Miles Smith's perspective, not even his, more Lovey's perspective. Lovey said yesterday when they announced that that he was going to look over the linebacker position and oversee it more. Why does he feel the need to do that at linebacker, but not at any other position on the defensive side of the ball? Like, if that's how you feel – you shouldn't be hiring that person to take over probably the most important position on the defense for the system that Lovey runs. I don't know what you think, Eli. Now, this is this is why I'm really glad Eli has the opinion he has. Because there's the 3% that has the, the situation like you where you go, this is a fine hire. This makes sense. Why does this make sense? Sell it to the 95% that don't think this well, makes the sense. First thing I want to <laughs> say, <laughs> well, the first thing I want to say is, uh, you know, stereotypical line, uh, hate the game, don't hate the player. Okay, in this sense, this is hate the game of hiring and hate the game of assistant coaching. Don't hate the player, because in this case right now, uh, you can't sit there and tell me. And because if you tell me this, I think it's a lie that you thought Miles Smith was never going to be hired on this staff somewhere. Doesn't make it right, though. Sure. But I think that that's a that's something that we all saw coming. It was going to happen eventually. Yes. Also, I agree. And that's that's a starting argument point. Another argument point to go off of is think about it from the perspective of, you know, what this happens in sports all the time. This is happening in sports all the time. This is happening in sports you, right now with Illinois. Hap- <laughs> well, yeah, but what I'm saying is this type of 
nepotism, which people call it, right, which hiring your family, it's happening constantly. People are going to certain schools because of it, because they have relatives that work there. Athletes go certain places because of the happens ties in that journalism they have there. too. It happens with every job, with every career. It's called connections, right? And there's a reason that Lovey Smith said what he said yesterday, right, during the press conference, which was everyone has a starting point. And guess what? If your father is the head coach of a Big Ten university, guess where your starting point is going to be? It's there. If your head, co- if your father is the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, guess where your starting point is going to be? With the Buccaneers. Okay, that's just how that's how this system works. So that's my first point that I think everyone needs to realize and everyone sure. needs to accept. Completely, completely agree. Because I think that. People can get upset with it, sure, but most of the things people are upset about are targeting Miles Smith himself. A lot of times, that's that's what the fan base, a lot of people are going after, is targeting him. That's not what you should be doing here, right? Secondly, I'm going to go into the fact that, Tati, you bring up a little bit of what I think is is worth going into. I, I wouldn't say that the inexperience is something that you know recruits would find cute or, or yeah. something like that. No, just and, genuine. Sure, like genuine. But what I say is is one thing that recruits have pointed out a couple times, and we heard Tremont Cooper say it, is he likes the family atmosphere of the way Illinois is run. When he goes there, he feels like family. So honestly, for me, I think that this works sometimes with recruits in the sense that you say, yeah, you know, my son's the linebacker's coach. He's going to be coaching you. You go, okay, I'm going to trust Lovey's son. I'm going to trust the guy that's related to Lovey. And I think that that's a selling point. We could talk about Miles Smith recruiting all we want. We don't know anything, sure. You can say you want to go hire a proven recruiter. I will say there's still assistant position spots open. There's a lot of assistant position spots that, that are on a team, right? But there's a pitch for you to make when you go out and you can recruit. And that pitch for Miles Smith has been and always will be my father's Lovey Smith. Come play for my dad. He, yeah, my father's Lovey Smith. But also, I have experience, you know, being with my father at the Buccaneers. I have experience being with my father at Illinois. I know how this all works. And, again, I think assistant coaches, I think people always sometimes, especially recently here, have put a little too much uh, emphasis on who's assistant coaching at the time because at first head coach, defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator are always going to come first and that's more important than anything else because when you have a good one of those and your team's good, people are going to come. So it's more about that, I think, than anything else. But it's about hating the game and not hating the player. At the end of the day, Miles My- Smith hasn't, sure, he hasn't done anything that to, to prove to you that he deserves this job, but he also hasn't done anything to prove to you necessarily that he doesn't yet. He's got a recruit to his name already. He's got one, right? And he just got the job yesterday. So he got someone to come already. Give the guy a chance to work through this. <laughs> give a guy, to, give the guy the chance. That's fair. Yeah, he, as a recruiter, he deserves I have that's nothing fair, yeah. bad to say. I think that being able to speak not only to like who he is as a coach, but who he is as a person, because it's literally your father. Um, I think that's really important. I think that a, a lot of times when you're being recruited or you're talking to these people, you're still meeting them on a very surface level, and t- they're telling you the positives. Now he can speak to like when dad gets mad go away yeah. and stuff like that. And he can, he can tell you the other side. Also, of who the understands this side, defense better than anybody else? Then the person Probably who Miles Smith. If we're going to be honest, if we're going to be completely honest, and we've seen with the former, we've seen with former hires, it doesn't matter if it's offensive coordinator when it was Garrick McGee, right? And it doesn't matter if it was defensive coordinator with Hardy Nickerson, who was, he, he left, but we, we all kind of know what the situation was around that. Uh, We've seen a situation where Lovey wants someone who understands his defense. And you can say whether or not you think his defense works. I don't care about that. But he his defense is being run regardless. He's the defensive coordinator now. So he needs someone who understands his defense. I can promise you that of all the people he interviewed, the person who understands his defense more than anybody else is going to be Miles Smith. And Miles Smith talked about it in that interview with me yesterday. He told me straight up to my face. He goes, I know these run reads. I've been working on them since I was learning how to read. So there you what go. I was going to say. There He's been go. around it. He, know, he, knows yes. what, he knows what to expect from these linebackers. It doesn't change the fact that he's never coached linebackers before. It doesn't change the fact that he's never recruited anymore. Everyone which is a somewhere. which is a very he's got time. Yeah, he and yeah. he'll have he'll have the year to do it, and he'll he has to really he has to hone in on it because Illinois will need him to be good. And now you have a situation. If you haven't heard today, Illinois also lost another coach. Illinois offensive line coach Luke Buckus was kind of poached by the Green Bay Packers. He'll be assistant coach there. Illinois is about to lose their strength and conditioning coach Joey Bose, who does an awesome job. He's going to go to the Cincinnati Bengals. He's tight with Zach Taylor, the Bengals' new coach. And now Illinois will also have to replace Thad Ward. So you're kind of having three guys to replace here. There's and plenty Lo- of spots open to grab Lovey, those go-to recruiters. Lovey Smith went out and decided not to hire a defensive coordinator and take that job himself so that you can add guys that recruit. I don't think Lovey or Miles Smith will be able to recruit the Houston area very well just because he is, hasn't been there. It's going to take him a while to get in there. It takes a couple years. But with the other spots open – 
You can add a chance to add a couple more dynamic recruiters. And now you added another guy to that, you know, that defensive side of the room that knows what to expect. He knows what the expectations are. And let's not forget this. Lovey Smith's not going to take it easy on him either, right? That, that he's not going to treat him easy at all. And Miles Smith said that to me yesterday. Lovey Smith will not be afraid to, to, he said, rip into me if I'm not getting my butt in shape. So absolutely. I, I think that it's his position. We can touch a little bit more on it after we take a really quick break here, but we need to take our second break. It's just something that I, I think people need to calm down about. There's, there's some sides that people need to take a look at. Uh, when we get back, Alec, if you have a final thought, you can give it when we get back. Otherwise, we're going to talk about the NBA trade deadline to wrap up the show. Big day for that. So make sure you stick with us here on the line. I drive 1071 WPG. And welcome back to Illini Drive here on 1071 WPGU. If you missed what we just talked about, I'm sorry. Man, <laughs> bit, great conversation. It was really good. It was, it, yeah, it was good. There's, there's, I wish we had a podcast. It's, oh. a little, it's, a little, it's a little heated, you know? It was a little heated, but it's good. I think it's a good discussion. We talked about Miles Smith. Uh, hey, but this will be on Twitter, too, right? This video is always posted. Yeah. So uh, that, that'll be good. What, is there a ban of public television, right? So that it's going to be posted on there. So people want to go uh, find, and you can, find you can it on listen Twitter. to us next Tuesday because I'm sure we'll be talking about it more. It'll be awesome. Uh, sure, yeah. There's plenty of time to talk about. It. Um, we we have five minutes left, roughly. Uh, you know, people don't necessarily love to hear us talk about things that aren't Illinois sports, but we're going to talk about the NBA deadline because the NBA trade deadline was because it was today. freaking awesome. It was great. <laughs> um, I guess with five minutes left, I mean, we don't have a, a ton to to be able to get into here, but maybe let's just say our favorite trade of the day. Well, maybe. Get into that a little bit. So, Isaac, was there a trade that stuck out to you today that you really, really liked? I love Nikola Mirotic going to the Bucks. I think that is really, really intriguing to me. I think the Bucks needed to add a couple more shooters to that mix around Giannis, around Middleton, and and they did. And, and Mirotic has had a really solid season, and I think that's a great fit for him. He knows this division. He knows what it's like to play here. He can really play at a high level, and I think that that really helps the Bucks kind of I think I I don't know if it necessarily gets them over the edge I and mean, helps them beat the Raptors or help them you know kind of beat the Celtics or the Sixers, but man they're going to be really close. It's going to be a dogfight in the Eastern Conference Finals. They're going to be so so fun. You mentioned the Raptors. That's my favorite one. Them getting Marcus Saul. Really, that is my favorite one. I think that Marcus Saul is a not an over or an underrated player. Maybe just slightly overlooked. Um, now that gives them two pretty good bigs with Marcus Saul and Serge Ibaka. And then they also have Kyle Lowry out at the guard position in Kawhi. I think that's a pretty good four. Now, I don't know if it's as good as the Celtics four if they're all playing well, but I've liked the Raptors all year. I know they started really hot and they've kind of slowed down, but I'm a huge fan of that move that the Raptors made today for Marcus Saul. I think that's a, that's an interesting pick. That For me, that's towards the end, and I, I say that only because I think giving up Valachutis wasn't necessarily worth it. He's had his injuries, but he's also way younger than Marcus Saul. Eight years I, younger. I, I mean, yeah, this is a situation where you know, you're just kind of you're you're using, you're going with Marcus Saul for you know maybe another couple of years, but he doesn't have much time uh, left on his playing. Thirty. So you're yeah. So you're really thinking that it, not. I'm not saying you in particular. I'm just okay. saying people are really thinking. The Raptors are really thinking that you know. I guess this is the year, and they're going all for it. And the East is anyone's for the taking, so it's possible. But that, does I, it matter though? Does the team who comes out of the East even matter? Are they going to beat the Warriors? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't care if it's – they don't think that way. Let's just say that. <laughs> there is, they, they want yeah, to I mean, think It's I, still a big deal if you get to the We finals. all know the ending to this story, but it's going to be really fun to yeah. read to the end because this is going to be so fun to watch it all. Um, my my favorite, personally, I, I love Mark Fultz going to the match. Oh, boy. I, I, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of that. Um, I think that – you know, why not? I think why not? If you're Orlando and they, they described it well, their front office, their GM described it well, they said this is a high risk, this is a, a, a low risk, high reward situation, right? Where we're bringing in Mark Helfold. This is a former number one draft pick. You know, this is this is a former guy that is was at the top two years ago that you thought were gonna, was going to come in. Sure, he's had his injury problems. Sure, he's had his also mental problems. That's been a big thing for him to fight back from having these uh, these injuries. But one change of scenery, I think, is always good. Uh, it, it, that's going to help him a lot. Two, this Orlando Magic team's really fun. I mean, when you're able to have Gordon, Jonathan Isaac, Mo Bamba, Fukovic, and then now you have at your point guard, who DJ Augustine should not have been your number one point He's guard. He's a great, great backup. backup. Not your number one point guard. Now you have Markel Fultz. That's, I mean, that, that team's good. And that team is, 
I, I know that uh, one thing that's always common on uh, Bill Simmons' podcast that he always says is uh, NBA League Pass teams. If you want to talk about an NBA League Pass team, the Orlando Magic right now, I'd love to watch every single one of their games next year because well, Markel Fultz is healthy and playing. The Magic is my second team. The, I'm watching every Mavs game last year. That's my oh, main sure, one. Sure. I'm Don't just saying after it, this trade, right. I, I really like what the Magic is doing. And, uh, and you know, the trade's fine for, for the Sixers. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, you can play Simmons a little bit, but at the end of the day, I mean, you're, you got two picks. Uh, one that I believe they used to have and they got rid of, and now they have it back. Those two picks are going to be fine. So and I think so too. I think that this is a great move for both sides. Markel Fultz, all I'm not really worried about his shoulder; I'm more worried about his head. And once if he gets his sure, head on yeah. straight, if he gets his head on straight, that'd be a heck of a thing. And I hope I hope it works out because if the Magic are good and Markel Fultz is good, that's a great storyline in the East because eventually they're going to play the Sixers or something in the playoffs, and that would be awesome. So I, I hope he does well. This NBA trade deadline would have been way better if Anthony Davis got dealt. He didn't, though. I understand it, and this summer is going to be so, so well, fun. Well, honestly, maybe it wouldn't have been better because now the summer might be better. So that's that's You're, what I'll this take. Is, that's a good uh, point. All right, that's going to wrap it up for us. Great show. Alec, thank you for being on. It was yeah, good to have you. you. I had a lot of fun. The nerves quickly went out the yeah, door. Yeah, see, it's just a conversation. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, so that's it for myself, Eli Schuster, alongside Isaac Trotter and producer Tati Perry. Perry that's going to wrap it up. Uh, yeah, tune in next week on on Monday for Jake's show, and then we'll be back on Tuesday. Have a great weekend. You're listening to Illini Drive here on 107.1 WPGU.